I'm Abhijit. I'm a tech lead manager at uh, NVIDIA. Hey, uh, this is Arpit. I'm a senior software engineer at NVIDIA. So by a show of hands, how many of you manage GPU clusters? Oh, wow. And that's a lot. And how many GPUs or how many nodes in your cluster? 10, 20, 30, 50, 100? OK. 500? 1,000? 5,000? 10,000? More than 10,000? Oh, nice. Nice. You are in right talk. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, in this talk, we'll go over uh, the motivation for resiliency, understanding some of the characteristics of AI workloads. We'll see where failures come from. Uh, we'll look into AI infrastructure components and uh, bring up and validation. Then we'll talk about uh, fault tolerance and its building blocks. And then the four pillars of fault tolerance, the monitoring, propagation, recovery, and uh, remediation. And then we'll see where's the scope for enhancement as a community. So why do we need fault tolerance in AI workloads? Inherently, AI hardware is complex. Here you see the schematic of a uh, uh, DJX H100-200 uh, system. In addition to the typical components in a CPU server, like you know the CPU sockets, DRAM, and VME drives, and fans, there are a few additional components. Um, these two are the 400 gig Ethernet cards that are used to connect to your uh, high-performance parallel file system, like Luster. Then you have the eight InfiniBand cards which are connected to the backend network. They connect to the GPUs. Um, you know, could be H100, 200. And then those, all the GPUs inside a server are connected to each other via the NV switch over a 900 gigabyte GPU to GPU interconnect. Yeah, it's 900 gigabytes. And um, the second dimension, so on one side we have complex hardware and the second dimension is very large scale. Um, you can imagine a single training job being run at this scale uses up all the nodes in your data center, all the GPUs, all the InfiniBand connections, and everything. Um, here's the topology for a 1,000 GPU uh, rail-optimized fabric. By rail-optimized, it means you want to minimize the number of collisions that can happen. And so it uh, creates a two-layer topology. Uh, at 32K scale, again, you can you know, drive some of that through a two-layer topology, but so depending on your, how your backend is connected, could be two or three layers. And the scale keeps growing. There are already 100K plus GPU clusters in production, and 200 and 300K GPU clusters are being built. Uh, when you combine the effect of complex hardware with scale, the combined effect is synergistic. So it's compounding rather than additive. Uh, at a scale, of course, we want to run you know, training of billions and trillions of parameter models. Uh, the GPU server is a very sophisticated, high-performance piece of equipment, but it comes with its own complexity. There are several sources of failure, like power, uh, CPU, GPU, the memory, network, cables, software, and then data center components, like uh, the network design and the cooling design. Um, moreover, some components may not fail completely. They might just run in a degraded state, making it harder to detect. Um, failures in LLM training are catastrophic because the training workload is a tightly coupled synchronous workload, which means it is at the intersection of distributed systems which expect failures and HPC systems which cannot tolerate failures. Uh, moreover, Users expect a fire and forget experience where they just want to submit their job and walk away and then be notified after the job completes. So let's take a step back and understand the characteristics of AI workloads. Uh, Pre-training or training is uh, one of the uh, large scale workloads that's running uh, on these clusters. It's a long running and synchronous workload, requires high storage throughput for data read and write. Uh, there's also a very high amount of traffic over the backend nodes, and uh, it's a large-scale multi-node, multi-GPU workload. 
and a single training job is usually run within the entire data center. Fine tuning is a, a smaller form of training, which, which is a, a short running synchronous workload, less than 24 hours. Uh, there's, of course, high uh, traffic over the back end with frequent small writes, but the scale of the job is smaller with 8 to 32 GPUs. And then there is the inference when you run your models in production. This is a request response type of workload um, which has batch input and streaming output. It is very sensitive to front end network latencies, employs load balancing and auto scaling. Uh, many concurrent instances of uh, the model can be deployed for inference in parallel, and the blast radius for failures is limited to individual instances. Uh, in addition, um, Simulation is another workload that runs on AI clusters. It's not, a, um, you know, it uses the same infrastructure, but um, it's, it's a long-running, medium-scale workload with high storage requirements, uh, running at medium scale. And the interesting part here is that the GPUs run in a mix mode, which is graphics. Some GPUs run in a graphics mode, and some GPUs run in compute mode. So uh, let's try to now that we understand the complexity and the scale and the characteristics of AI workloads. Let's see where do the failures come from. So the hard failures, which usually require a node reboot or an RMA, um, can be categorized like this. Like some, most of the failures, some of them come from the network fabric itself, the NVLink errors, the uh, external switches, um, GPU errors like ECC uncorrectable errors, uh, the disappearing GPU, like GPU falling off the bus, or it could be kernel driver bugs that wedge the application. System errors, like PCIe related, we have seen NVMe errors, um, all kinds of errors on the system itself, and intermittent storage errors also. Transient failures, failures uh, are recoverable, either, either by resetting the hardware component or uh, simply by rebooting the node. Typically, network link flap or bandwidth degradation is one of those. Uh, thermal slowdowns in GPUs, CUDA errors or NANDs uh, can be uh, sources of them. Remote storage performance degradation uh, can also be a source of uh, transient failures. And then, of course, application failures like out of memory or application crash due to bugs in the application itself. There are other failures that cannot directly be categorized into e either of these. We have seen a single faulty fan on a node in a 400 node cluster was causing heat to build up within that enclosure that uh, slowed down the training on all the nodes. We have seen another issue where a routine firmware upgrade in the IB switch in the data center caused huge performance degradation for multi-node training. And that was done over the weekend, so Monday morning, Developers or researchers come in, and suddenly the cluster is unusable. Meta has done some work on um, identifying the uh, failures and classifying them, and they have published a bunch of this work. I've uh, noted the source below. So while resiliency for AI is, you know, is a multi-layer and is applicable in every layer of the stack, from application software to libraries to frameworks lower level libraries, system software, kernel, uh, kernel drivers, and even the hardware. The focus of this talk is on the Kubernetes infrastructure. Now, uh, we'll look into details of the AI infrastructure and its components. Hey, uh, so we go over the, the AI infrastructure. The, the goal here is that you should be able to avoid failure at, at first place. Uh, prevent them because the cost of detecting at later stages increases. And then later on, we will go into when failures happen, when the job is running, what to do. OK, so to do that, uh, let's first go into what are the components of the AI infrastructure stack. Uh, the, there are three main components. The first is the compute. In compute, we have GPU operator, scheduler, and MPI operator. GPU operator is, is a component which automates the provisioning of a software, which enables the kubelet to see the GPU by deploying our device plugin. It also uh, enables a bunch of other components for GPU management and health monitoring. Uh, the second is scheduler. We need a scheduler with gang scheduling to enable the multi-node job. 
It should also have uh, abilities like preemption and priority for the efficient utilization of resources. Uh, MPI operator, it enables a multi-node job and makes it easy to run the all, re all reduced style multi-node training. It configures the pod, injects the environment variable, and manages the life cycle of the multi-node job. The next is the network. Uh, the network has two components, network operator and ingress. Network operator manages the life cycle of RDMA, IB interfaces. It, uh, it enables a device plugin which exposes them to the kubelet. So when you do describe node, that's, that's how you see all the NICs as well as the GPUs. The ingress is responsible for enabling the users to do exec and attach into their jobs. The exec and attach is important functionality as machine learning researchers want to look into, uh, look into the jobs and do a debugging. The other piece of the picture is storage. There are three kinds of storage that we usually need. One is the node local scratch space. It's used for storing the ephemeral uh, computation or the transient data sets. The second is your uh, fast parallel remote storage, something like Lusher, where you can store your training code and data sets. Uh, it needs, it's useful when you share this data set with your colleagues, but also needs to have a ways you prevent the unauthorized access. The third is the object store, which is useful for storing the checkpoint. The checkpoints are useful when you restart the job or during the inference. And the last is observability. Uh, for monitoring, you need a Prometheus, Grafana, and a logging stack like Graylog. Uh, you might also need something like job metrics aggregator, which can export the job metrics so that end user can see those and determine the quality of the training. And the last is you need a node problem detector, which runs the plugins, uh, and which, which runs the plugin and can determine the infrastructure problems in the system, like kernel issues and all of that. Okay, so now we know what it takes to build the, the, the AI stack or the components of AI stack, and you have a, maybe a cluster ready. So we want to now validate that cluster. So how are we gonna do that? The so first is the software checks. We have to ensure that the, all the driver and libraries are compatible with each other. I can give an example. The network operator and GPU operator has to work together to enable the, the RDMA. And if they are not incompatible, you might see the degraded performance or maybe the multi-node will not even work. Uh, tools like Argo can help you to bring the cluster in a consistent state and make sure there's a predictable software running in the cluster. Okay, now the software stack is okay. Now we have to do tests. So you do a burn-in test. Uh, you do a GPU burn-in test and you can do an IB burn-in test and do them together to make sure the devices are behaving as expected. Uh, next is you make sure that the performance is okay. So we usually run the heavy nickel test it can consist of uh, GPU computation and all reduced style communication. And you have to ensure that the bandwidth reported by those nickel tests are within the tolerable limits. The other piece of picture which we often ignore is your control plane robustness. You might want to run a small, uh, a large number of small jobs to make sure your control plane is robust enough. Uh, then once we have reached that stage, you want to have an end-to-end -end check, which is a typical Megatron job or an LLM job, which touches your storage, compute, and network, all parts of a system. And then uh, the last, which is tuning. It's very close to my heart, too. Uh, so, so you have to do the system tuning to get a maximum performance out of your existing system. Sometimes you have to do OS tuning, like setting the VM max thread or FSI notify settings, which ensure that your system can give you best performance for that workloads. The other is the KTS client tuning. By default, if your system is have you using the kubeconfig client, they have a low value of QPS and burst. And if you do not tune them, your system component uh, will do the self-throttling. And you might see a slowness in, in, in them. OK. now. We have validated the cluster. Uh, let's start run a job. But you might run into an issues where jobs start running and immediately goes bad. So how do we prevent that? We do that by running pre-flight checks. They usually run as in form of init containers. Uh, you will do the you can do the pre-flight check by running the network storage and compute test. In the compute test, you run the GPU test and check the health, temperature, and memory. 
You might check for the ECC error. For the network test, you run a collective communication test, which is typically a nickel test, and ensure that the bandwidth reported by these nickel tests are within the tolerable limit. Third is the storage test. You might want to make sure that you have the, the persistent storage, which will be attached to your job. You have access to that, and you're able to read right into that. OK, so now we have covered the part of the cluster, how to validate, and how to run a pre light job. Now, if a job is running, and then it gets some issue happens. How do we get there? So enter the, the fault tolerance. So first, we're going to talk about the building blocks of fault tolerance and the mechanisms of the building blocks. There are four building blocks. Let's go over them one by one. The first is monitoring. Monitoring is defined as methods and processing of detecting fault and performance. Uh, it, you, measure, you can measure a good put degradation. Good put is defined as a useful computation versus a total elapsed time. The, another word that is used is uh, MFU uh, as a synonym to determine whether there's a degradation in the performance. The next is propagation. Once you detect the error, you have to upstream it to higher layers, and that, that mechanism is called propagation, so that higher layer can take action. It should ideally contain error message and error code. Uh, next is recovery. Recovery are the steps such that the entity that controls the job to determine the course of action depending on what error is there. It can range from you know, restarting the job to just maybe killing the job. And the last building block is remediation, which is the process of evaluating the fault and taking action to fix that fault is called remediation. Now we know what are the building blocks. Let's go how we can uh, implement what are techniques for them. So for monitoring, we use typically use heartbeats to detect the status of our critical components. You can also poll devices for any potential issues. And you can use watchdogs to watch over logs and determine if there are issues. Uh, for propagation, we rely on events, labels, condition, or even crash dumps for process level monitoring. Uh, then there is recovery. So recovery, you can do fast restart, local rank restart, node swap, uh, and or hot spares. These are various strategies by which you can recover a job. And the last is remediation. Uh, you can do like node reboot or system update or GPU link reset or sometimes even manual interventions. So these are the techniques. In next couple of sections, we are going to go deep dive into each of these building blocks. OK. Where are these techniques can be implemented? So, so monitoring can be implemented, and you can have a node-level fault aggregation, which can look over all monitoring components, give you an outcome whether a node is healthy or unhealthy. Uh, it can be in node problem detector in form of the plugins. It can be in G GPU device plugin. You can also have your uh, per rank monitor, which monitors the rank of your training job. Uh, propagation uh, lives in, prop in form of node condition or a pod condition or in Prometheus matrix. Uh, recovery can be implemented in MPI operator, job controller, and scheduler. Scheduler can be tuned to not consider unhealthy node for scheduling. And remediation can be in form of remediation operator or a node, node lifecycle management component. OK, now we know what, how, and where of the building blocks of fault tolerance. Let's deep dive into each one of them, starting with monitoring. So monitoring can typically be implemented using the four broad or five techniques. First is NVML. NVML is a C-based API for monitoring and managing various status of NVIDIA device GPU. It has Python and Perl binding available as well. It can integrate with your training code. Uh, DCGM exporter, it exports the, the GPU matrix uh, the DCGM is actually a set of tools for GPU monitoring and diagnostic, and it, it integrates with Kubernetes via the DCGM exporter, which exports the metrics which can be leveraged. Uh, kernel logs uh, is a reliable mechanism to detect the XID, SXID error, because GPU driver inherently logs into the, in there. Uh, and then there is, for networking issues, you can rely on the RDMA counters which lies in the SysFS and determine whether there are link flaps or things like that. Uh, you can have ML-specific job processes, and you can rely on failure message and ex exit code parsing to determine what fault has occurred. 
Okay, let's go deep into each of these. Uh, the first is the NVML. The NVML can help you get the, the ECC error count, which indicates that there's a data corruption or not. Uh, it also tells you about GP utilization. Low GP utilization, while the job is ongoing, is a sign of a, let's say, task hang. And if you want to debug more, you can find out the active compute processes running on this, uh, running on the GPU. Uh, temperature and fan, fan speed can be, uh, can be used to leverage, to reason the GPU performance degradation. And, and other identification details can be useful in remediation. Uh, this is the NVML sample code. It's a simple library. You just input, in, uh, you just import the library, go over each devices, and get the respective fan speed, name, temperature, or power usage. Okay, let's jump into DCGM. So DCGM exporter can export a lot of metrics, including XID or ECC error. This slide presents metrics specifically related to the clock throttle reasons. Uh, the clock throttling can lead to degraded performance and often can explain the straggler behavior. Uh, the software thermal or hardware thermal are indicator of temperature being too high. Display clocks determine the speed of rendering or display related tasks and clock setting determine the, the processor speed. Now let's figure out how to find XID or SXID error. You can typically set up a watchdog on kernel logs and you can find that signature string determining whether the XID error has occurred or not. The, why we use kernel logs? Because it's the most reliable mechanism to de detect XID and SXID, given the ephemeral nature of these events. The, the error reported from NV switch, it, it is logged as SXID, and error reported by GPU driver is logged as XID. Uh, you, uh, okay, so, Moving on, uh, the kernel logs can also help you determine the IB-related or network-related issues. So you can determine the IB link flaps uh, and uh, from the kernel logs by searching for those particular strings. And they can often explain the behavior of a nickel timeouts or issues like that. The Ethernet link flap can also be determined using D messages. And these link flap can also be the root cause of your mysterious application failures. Uh, the other is the, the RDMA counters. Uh, they can be used to determine the network issues, for example, packet sequence count or local act timeout error. They indicate that there's an issue with the node-to-node -node communication. Link flap counter tell us how many times the RDMA interface has flapped. Uh, this link down and link recovery are the counter to determine how many times the IB link has flapped. They can often explain your nickel timeout and transient application failure. We are often sometimes in those situations where the application fails when we look at the system, uh, it, it seems fine. And that's when these come handy, because uh, a link flap, it means that uh, at time of application failure, the link has flat, but when you look at it, it seems fine. Okay, now let's go into the troubleshooting test. Uh, so one is we use nickel test. The, you, can, you can conduct a pairwise nickel test and by running a test in pods, the nickel test status and reported bandwidth, they can indicate that whether there's an issue with application or there's an issue with underlying hardware. Uh, if the nickel test passes, that means that your application might be having some issues. But if there's an issue with the hardware, you might need to do further debugging. You have to start probably from foundation and you have to work your way up. You first want to check the device status using typical commands like IBV device, in, device info or MST status or IB stat, depending on the type of your network setup and environment. Uh, once you know the device it is okay, you might want to do some ping test. Uh, and then you can further do the bandwidth test uh, if ping, ping tests are okay. The bandwidth test can help you determine whether there's a degradation in bandwidth in your system or not. Uh, sometimes it is also important to look into, to start from the lower hardware level. And you can use commands like MLX link or MLX config, which can tell you about the state of the link and the device configuration respectively. Uh, if the device status is up and, and ping tests fail, uh, that means that there can be an issue with your network control plane management software. Or sometimes uh, we have seen issues where the device status is down, it would have it pointed us to a CNI issue or the issue with the deployment of your network operator components. Okay, now this is covered monitoring. Like if you have we discussed about how we figure out XID error, clock throttle error, which tells the degradation. 
uh, we, we talked about the network or IB link error. Now let's talk about propagation. Propag so once error are detected, they need to be propagated to the higher layer up. The error signal, which is typical in form of, let's say, a polling device or kernel XID can be sent to a node fault aggregator, which can also listen to, let's say, DCGM matrix. The node fault aggregator can translate this signal into a node condition as well as a pod condition. Why pod condition? Because the job controller only monitors pods. It does not monitor nodes. This pod condition can be taken as an input by MPI operator and can further be taken as an input by job controller who can take a recovery action as well as, as well as up, uh, as well as translate that message into a job status. Your node condition will be an input to your remediation operator, which can send that input further to your hardware provider, who can, uh, who can use this message to, de to determine the long-term patterns of the failure and can take uh, corrective action. Uh, scheduler can also use this message uh, the, the node condition message to reject the node from further scheduling until the remediation is done on that particular node. Uh, here you see a typical status of a job after it is requeued. So it indicates that we, the, the controller has detected the error so, and restarted it. That's why it moved from running to queued and then back to running. And queued indicates the, the error that has occurred. Okay, so now from monitoring to propagation, now let's go over the recovery strategies. Okay. Thanks, Arpit. So recovery is all about you know, getting your job back up and running and making progress. So there are a few options available. This is more in the application and your job lifecycle. So there are a few op options available depending on what caused the error in the first place and how many resources you have in a cluster. A job workload can be recovered either within the job itself, if, if the application has the ability to do that, or you can do a cluster-wide restart. And there are a bunch of options for each of these, and we'll go through them. The quickest form of recovery is an in-process recovery, where if your process crashes or dies, you just restart it locally. Um, maybe you have a monitor running. Of course, this depends on um, what kind of errors caused the process to die in the first place. So things like link flaps or GPU CUDA errors, uh, you could use this strategy. Um, this strategy can sometimes take a time, take some time for the uh, new thread to start because of loading the libraries and loading the GPU memory and all that. So you might want to optimize it by running a you know background process that just sleeps waiting for the main process to die. And when the main process dies, it just uh, recovers and uh, continues the work. Um, if the application is able to support it and if the failure is not transient, then you might have to move to a, a different node. Uh, one way to do that is if you don't have additional uh, capacity in the cluster, the application can just run on the healthy nodes and uh, exclude the node where the failure happened. Uh, this, of course, means that you have loss in capacity in the application and so your performance may not be as much as it was earlier. But the restart on the healthy nodes means that your, pro your application can make progress. Uh, there might be some additional requirements from the DL layers or frameworks, like uh, flexible checkpoints to work on different uh, sizes of the uh, hardware resources available, and say a compilation cache, depending on what framework you're using. The other way, if you can, your application can support it, is to start with the hot spare. The spare nodes are just idle capacity that you keep on standby in case you know, one of the nodes where you're running the job fails, you just migrate over to the spare capacity and abandon the node that you were running on. Uh, warm sparing minimizes restart time, but also locks up capacity that could be used for other kind of workloads. Now, if it is not possible to restart your application uh, within the job itself, it calls for a cluster level restart. For that, you can imagine a workflow where the fault detection um, happens and the monitoring components bubble up the error, propagate it or using node condition updates or pod up condition updates through the API server and into your MPI operator and job controller. Once the job controller gets it, it can um, you know, trigger either restart or just kill the job if there's just too many uh, of your resources have failed. 
It's also possible sometimes that your application will notice errors before the monitoring components can notice. And in that case, various exit codes can be used to uh, send a message to the job controller that it needs to be restarted. A naive job of uh, restart, of course, is the simplest to implement. If a job fails and it exits with a non-zero error code, you just restart it. But depending on the type of cluster you have, uh, it can lead to some negative effects where if you have a multi-user, multi-tenant cluster, then the newly scheduled job can be at the end of the queue or have a higher startup time, depending on what nodes get selected. Uh, you, there are some optimizations possible to reduce the queue time. It could you know, uh, be restarted with a higher priority. And to reduce the startup time, you could choose to use a bunch of the healthy nodes from the previous run that are available in the cluster. Of course, it's also possible to start with a reduced world size, uh, but then in this case, you'll have to adjust the application parameters <coughs> to make sure that the application understands that there are fewer resources this time uh, when it's starting the workload. The next is to start with warm spares. If you have enough capacity in your cluster, uh, you keep some nodes idle, and then if one of the node fails with a non-transient error, then you can move the workload over to the uh, standby or the warm nodes. Uh, this way, uh, the application can run with uh, expected capacity. However, some capacity in your cluster overall is lost to standby nodes, which are just sitting there idle, and you don't want to probably do that. In the next slide, we'll see how to optimize that. So if your scheduler can support preemption, uh, you, might want, you might run lower priority applications on those spare nodes. And then when the main job runs into an error, you can preempt an existing workload. Uh, low priority workload could be something like a fine tuning or a data parallel uh, job that is running and can be preempted. And you can move the application over to that node and therefore you know, keep the utilization high. Once you've figured out that, hey, so one node has to be cordoned off then you'll need to run some tests on it to make sure that it is in a healthy state. And for that, typically you'd go through a node life cycle kind of uh, workflow where uh, it's required to run some tests um, on the node, which will try to detect and attribute the error to a subsystem. Uh, tests should be run to make sure that the um, IB links, the GPUs and memory and all of those are tested, but not in isolation because typically a failure in one subsystem can cause uh, the other subsystem to fail. So typically you want to run tests that exercise the entire node and all of the components in it. If those tests succeed, you could move that node back into production. If not, a reboot could be used. If that also doesn't work, then you might have to move the node into um, RMA or some manual intervention might be required. Here are some of the uh, uh, some of the um, typical errors that we see and uh, what you can do with it. Uh, lost GPU or falling off the bus is a very common error. And sometimes kubectl can report GPU as missing for a benign XID error. Um, it is advisable to check NVML uh, if the GPU actually has an error and is missing. In case it does, then a node reboot can help. If that also doesn't work, it might be required to replace the GPU. Uh, if your GPUs or NICs are overheating, most likely it is due to an, uh, bad fans or improper cooling, and you might need a NOR RMA. Uh, link loss can happen temporarily or permanently. You might have to check the uh, NICs it's themselves. They also can sometimes uh, behave differently when they overheated. The switches uh, in your data center and a node reboot might help as well. Sometimes your CSI pods lose connection to the remote storage, so checking the status and resetting them will also help. The, uh, we have, NVIDIA has given a bunch of guidelines and a, a nice flowchart for GPU debugging, and uh, I've listed the link here. So with that, Arpit will talk about enhancements. Yeah, here we come to the last part. So these are the few, ish, few things we observed as a gap in the ecosystem. Uh, first is that we are in a situation where we have to scale to 100,000 GPUs, which means that to 10 to 15,000 worker nodes. Today, Kubernetes max supports 
is around 5,000 nodes. So we might have to start thinking about scale from the point of view of etcd API server. The scale need to be thought through with this new uh, training paradigm. Uh, the KTS scheduler is not natively for gang scheduling. So we might need preemption and priority uh, in build. And the, we, 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 there's a lack of standardized error code, which can help the job controllers and application writer to, uh, to communicate via a common understanding and help distinguish between infrastructure and application errors. So with this slide end, uh, any questions or you can scan the, the QR code to give us feedback for this session. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So, um, do you have any recommendations or checkpointing strategies? Yeah. So, for checkpointing, it's a very um, framework um, specific strategies. Uh, we have collaborated with uh, various companies across the industry and working with the frameworks like PyTorch, JAX, and other frameworks to uh, help with um, making checkpointing faster. Uh, so things like asynchronous checkpointing, in-memory checkpointing, and very fast recovery strategies is something that's work in progress to <coughs> be available. Um, There's also in a gap in ecosystem today. There is no way an infra can tell the application to do the checkpoint. Yeah. yeah. yeah w one thing you might want to do is in the slide where the job controller is sending a signal to the application to die, it might, one of the steps the application can do is, hey, do just-in-time checkpoints before it dies so that next time you have very little amount of work that is actually lost after you restore. Thank you. Um, so what is the main difference between remediation and recovery? It looks like very similar. So remediation is on the node side where you want to test run tests on the node and figure out what components have failed and then take corrective actions. Recovery is on the job and application side where you want to figure out what's the fastest way to restart the job or remove the uh, faulty nodes from your working set and continue your job with um, the healthy nodes that you have in your cluster or in your data center. So, so basically difference in scope? Difference in scope yeah. and also different layers. I'm sure you guys are aware of Lollipop, right, inside of NVIDIA. Uh, Aaron Erickson's project to build autonomous AI observability agents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do, do, you, do you use that source for um, we, some of the? Yeah, we have not used that in oh, our. Okay, maybe that's a use case. I know sure. it started with primarily Slurm clusters, okay. but I think there's isn't there some project now going on too with um, ex expanding those things into Kubernetes, right? Okay. So we'll, it might be we'll, we can look might be that. interesting. I think the yeah. time is up. We we can discuss outside or here it's as well. Fine. Oh, we can yeah. take one more question. If that, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, hi, this is Wenghui from like, Badance. Like previously, like you mentioned, like uh, I think someone from NVIDIA mentioned that like, you just released the HCC, like, like a confidential container. Uh, so I was wondering like if we open the HCC mode, uh, are the monitoring still work and um, it, are all the like uh, special registers still open to the yes. like uh, VMs? or like a partially are down? Like. So NVML should still be able to give you the information that's required. So it's still through exactly the same process? Yes, it is still the same process. Uh, confidential compute encrypts the data in the memory, not the uh, monitoring aspects of the GPU. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.